Hi, everybody. So we have today with us, this is Ask the Doctor with Dr. Larry Golby. And we're going to be talking with him about a couple of questions that were submitted previously. I'm going to go ahead and ask Dr. Golby to show his video and unmute himself right now. We're going to take a moment to start streaming this live on Facebook with some friends. So give us one moment. I'm going to let Joanna take care of that, actually. Um, few housekeeping notes while Joanna's tackling that is that this is one of a series of webinars with Dr. Golby. Um, any medications that he mentions today should not be taken unless it's under the direction of a medical professional. We're so very grateful for all of our donors that gave during registration. You guys have been super generous and have helped us raise over $500 today. So a big round of applause for all of you. Um, we, <laughs> we have a couple of new functions here if you've joined us in the past. If you'll notice, they're in the toolbar at the bottom. We've got a Q&A box, so if you have any questions, drop your questions into the Q&A box. There is also a little thumb there, so if you have the same question that you see has been submitted, go ahead and click the thumbs up button to like it, to let them know that you have the same question on that one. Um, please feel free to use the chat function as well but please do not mention any personal or private medical information in the chat function. And without much further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Joanna Teeters and she's gonna kick it off. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. We are now streaming live on Facebook. Um, my name is Joanna Teeters. I'm the Community Outreach and Resource Manager at Cure PSP. And we are so pleased to have Dr. Golby here with us today, and thank you all for tuning in. Um, Dr. Golby is one of the world's leading clinical experts in progressive supranuclear palsy and related neurological, neuro neurodegenerative conditions like multiple system atrophy and corticobasal degeneration. This is our third Ask the Doctor webinar, and please note that the recordings of the previous two sessions can be found archived on our YouTube channel. Dr. Golby has long been associated with Cure PSP as a board member director of clinical affairs and head of its scientific advisory board. He is the author of A Clinician's Guide to Progressive Supranuclear Palsy, published by, by Rutgers University Press, and he developed with Pamela A. Oman Strickland a clinical rating scale for progressive supranuclear palsy that is the standard for the diagnosis of the disease. After the webinar, we will provide a link to our patient resource collection on our Cure PSP website. We encourage you to please visit this webpage and download any documents that correlate to the disease that you are most interested in. Many of these documents were compiled and edited by Dr. Golby and cover quite a bit of what is discussed in today's webinar and the previous webinars. As Jacqueline mentioned, the questions that Dr. Golby will be answering in today's webinar were previously submitted by patients and families. We will not be taking any live questions today, but please feel free to type in any questions in the Q&A box below so that they may, they may be considered for future webinars. The next webinar is scheduled for July 7th, and that is going to be Ask the Doctor number four. At this time, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Bowlby for joining us and turn it over to you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Jacqueline. You can hear me okay? Yes. All right, uh, in addition to your disclaimer about the medications, I also wanna add that uh, almost none of the medications I might mention today, or devices I might mention, have been approved by the FDA for the conditions that I might recommend them for. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, well, we have a list of about, there were about uh, 75 questions submitted. Of course, we can't get to all of them, but I've highlighted some that I think are of uh, popular 
interest and, and some that haven't been asked before in either of the two Ask the Doctor sessions. So, as I did in each of the previous two sessions, I want to start out with a COVID-related question. Because um, that's, if it's not foremost, it should be foremost in everybody's mind. Um, there, uh, somebody said, um, my husband's in a nursing home and I can't see him. Uh, requires total care, can't communicate other than a thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, I won't uh, go into the other details of, of his advanced disability that she described. The facility does not understand the disease. Very common. A lot of doctors don't understand the disease. How do I advocate for him under the current circumstances? Uh, all right, well, that's a very good question. Um, you may start by um, asking to sit down with a, a social worker or the nursing director and um, bring, explain about PSP or give them a, a copy of some kind of a lay language article uh, that describes the disease. You don't want a, an entire book because they won't have time for that but give them some, some idea of what's involved with the disease and come up with a plan whereby you can make notes of things you wanna to bring to the staff's attention and on some regular basis that's consistent with their schedule, uh, figure out a way to bring those, uh, those observations to their attention. And of course, you should uh, phrase everything in a very respectful way. You have to respect the staff's professionalism, respect their time demands, and this way you can, uh, in a collegial collaborative way, try to solve the problems that you've seen and also come up with a plan so that if you see anything that's urgent that can't wait for the next scheduled meeting, uh, figure out a way to bring it to their attention. There are lots of things on the Cure PSP website that can be used for that initial step of allowing the staff at the facility to educate themselves about PSP. So this is not an unsolvable problem at all. Okay, uh, let's get down to some common symptoms here. How to control drooling and dry mouth associated with PSP. This may sound odd, but those two things can happen in the same person. Uh, the first thing I always recommend for either of those is a lollipop. I know that sounds kind of country duck, but uh, sucking on a lollipop will stimulate saliva for people who have a dry mouth. And for people who have drooling, it will uh, stimulate the swallowing reflex. The sweetness of the lollipop uh, will, uh, will induce the person to swallow, uh, even though they may not have been swallowing automatically, uh, ordinarily. If that doesn't work, uh, then for dry mouth, the next thing I would try is something equally benign a saliva spray. It looks like a breath spray. You can buy it in a drugstore and um, it has a kind of a sticky feel in your mouth, but it, it can be very helpful. Um, frequent mouthwashes. There's, um, there's a product called a lemon glycerin swab. It looks like a huge Q-tip that you can um, that you can swab around inside the person's mouth if they can do it themselves. And it leaves a, um, a long acting film that uh, is a, a moisturizing and has a lemon taste. Now for the drooling, uh, there, are, um, there are medications that will dry up the mouth. Of course, a lot of medications do that as a side effect. Uh, there's a whole class of medications called the anticholinergics that, uh, that are especially likely to do that. Um, there's a, a drug called atropine, which is available in drops. And one drop of atropine into the mouth will kind of paralyze the salivary glands. The problem with atropine is that it can get into the brain and cause confusion. So I don't like to use that. But there are medications that can accomplish the same thing taken by mouth that do not get into the brain and they can uh, dry up your mouth the problem is that they, although they don't get into the brain, they can affect organs 
otherwise, for example, it can cause constipation. It can cause uh, hesitancy of urination. So, so those things are, have to be used carefully. Uh, there's also uh, Botox injections into the salivary glands that will paralyze them. This, uh, of course, has to be done by a, a specialist. Uh, it has to be repeated every three months. So it's a, it's a pretty big undertaking, but it works reasonably well. And finally, if none of those things are, are working or are practical, there is um, bedside suction uh, devices. Uh, these, if you Google uh, suction machines, you'll see a whole catalog of different price ranges and styles and uh, features. And they range from about 50 bucks to a thousand bucks. And um, it's just something where the caregiver or the patient themselves can just take a wand and uh, just move it around in the mouth and suck up the excess saliva. Okay, let's move on here. I had, there were a lot of questions about sleeping. Now, you know, when you read a, uh, a quick description of PSP somewhere, very often the sleep problems are not gonna make the list. And, and I'm guilty of that also in, for many years when I was describing PSP in some published thing, I would neglect to put the sleep there, uh, the sleep problems, but sleep is a major issue with PSP. And in fact, if you look at the list of parts of the brain that are involved in PSP, it's very, very significantly overlapping with the list of parts of the brain that control sleep. So in PSP, it's, it's two problems. One is daytime sleepiness and the other is nighttime insomnia. And the insomnia might be trouble falling asleep or it might be trouble staying asleep. And um, I'm, I'm not gonna go into the long list of medications that can help, but um, it's very useful to, um, to just work on basic sleep hygiene as the first, the first line of attack. So for example, um, avoiding too many naps during the day. If you feel like napping during the day, uh, the best thing would be to just kind of get up and do a little exercise, walk around, have something sweet to drink. So maybe you can get past that sleepy period without having to sleep and then you'll sleep better at night. And then the next day, maybe you won't need a nap. Uh, that's one thing. Um, especially naps in the evening are especially likely to interfere with sleeping during the night. Uh, very often a uh, reason that people wake up during the night is that their bladder is full. So uh, of course there are medications that will um, inhibit the urge to void. These, these are FDA approved medication. You've, you've seen them advertised on TV. Um, but also uh, avoiding fluids in the evening. Make, make the last fluid of the evening at dinner time and if you have to take medications at bedtime, okay, use as little fluid as possible for that. Um, now the problem, there's also a problem with PSP in the constant uh, level of alertness. This is, this is actually a sleep disorder uh, caused by the, the problem in the brain in PSP. Uh, we don't have a great way of treating this, but sometimes the medications that are used for um, people with work shift disorder, people who, people who have to work different shifts at different times and they may have to take something to keep them awake. Um, these, are, these drugs are in the amphetamine class, but they don't generally have the undesirable amphetamine side effects. Those drugs can be taken during the day and usually they, they work pretty well with, without very much side effects. Of course, they're easily abused and so it may be difficult to, uh, getting your hands on them. Um, the same drugs are used for narcolepsy, which is a neurological condition where you fall asleep uncontrollably during the day. That can happen at any age. Okay. Um, there were several questions on genetics as there have been in the previous two sessions. Uh, so th this deserves uh, some, some attention. Um, in this question, the person, uh, the woman said her husband was diagnosed with PSP and then we learned at that time that his maternal uncle uh, died from PSP. Um, 
So how often is this? What's the genetic connection of PSP? Uh, there is generally a very weak genetic component of PSP. Now keep in mind that familial aggregation and a genetic cause are two different things. What do I mean by familial aggregation? Sorry for the long words. Familial aggregation is just the tendency of a disease to happen in more than one member of a family. Uh, and there are, there are a reasonable number of families where you do see a parent and child or two siblings or an uncle and a nephew or something, uh, but that's it in the whole family. So it doesn't behave like, uh, like Huntington's disease in that regard or Tay-Sachs. Uh, so the, the actual molecular research projects looking at the DNA of people with PSP have found a handful of genes that when they're in a certain, a certain variant form, in other words, mutated, when they're in that variant form, which is present in only a small percentage of the population, it increases the risk of getting PSP a little bit, very little. I mean, we're talking way less than 5% with each of these genes. But maybe if you have multiple genes on the list in the same person, then your risk of PSP is a little higher. Still, it's not gonna be enough to cause multiple members in the same family to get the disease. So when my patients ask me, are my children at risk of getting PSP? I say, no, they do not have to change their lifestyle, their financial planning, their careers, anything like that. Uh, they should just assume that they're not gonna get PSP because the chance of it is just so uh, infinitesimally higher than in the general population, very small additional risk. Uh, now, there is one family in the literature, uh, and I've heard of uh, another family that hasn't been published, that where PSP is present in like six or seven people in a family, and not one nuclear family, but including multiple generations, aunts, uncles, second cousins. And uh, that's, that's just vanishingly rare. But those families may have uh, a lot to teach us about what causes PSP in general. So it should be, those should be researched. Right now, there is a big project that is very close to completion where researchers are doing uh, sequencing of all of the exons. In other words, all of the, the genes that actually make protein, uh, that encode protein sequencing of all of the exons. It's called a whole exome sequencing in many hundreds of patients with PSP and a similar number of people without PSP. And uh, that's gonna be published soon. I can tell you that it's, it's, not gonna re it's not gonna reveal very much beyond the 2011 publication that was done with a lower level of technical sophistication that revealed uh, about a half a dozen genes that each have that very low risk. Okay, let's move on. Linda Ronstadt, been getting questions about her. She reports that she has PSP Parkinson's. Is there such a thing? Can the two diseases occur together? Uh, well, uh, yes, there is such a thing as PSP Parkinson's, but it's not a combination of the two diseases. It is a form of PSP, which exists in something like 25 to 35% of people with PSP. It was first described in um, 2005, uh, and it's where the person starts out looking like they have Parkinson's, but then some atypical things start to accumulate, like they are not responding that well to levodopa, carbidopa. They're having a little more balance problems. They might be having a little more swallowing and speech problems than you see with Parkinson's. And then after a few years, it kind of gradually emerges that, hey, this is starting to look like PSP. They start to develop the characteristic eye movement problems and the uh, more falls and things like that. And um, if you look at their brain under the microscope, it's exactly like anybody else with PSP, except that the problem is in a slightly different distribution. It, it, it emphasizes a different part of the brain. 
So that may be what she has. I don't know. I have no inside information about Linda Ronstadt. Uh, just from my looking at her in her um, recent uh, appearances, uh, it does not look at all like she has PSP. It, it looks like Parkinson's to me, but, but sometimes people with PSP Parkinson's can have that appearance, um, especially to somebody who can only see them on a, on a video. Um, are there any vitamins or supplements that you're currently recommending for those with corticobasal syndrome or neurodegenerative disease in general? Uh, I've mentioned this at the other two uh, sessions and it's worth mentioning again. Um, there is this nutru, uh, it's called a nutraceutical. It's a nutritional substance, a food substance that's marketed as if it were a drug. It's, uh, it's available over the counter. It's called coenzyme Q10 in its liposomal form, liposomal, L-I-P-O-S-O-M-A-L, because the actual drug is encapsulated in these microscopic little bubbles of, of oil or fat called liposomes. And that allows the stuff to get into the brain through the blood-brain barrier. Otherwise, uh, regular coenzyme Q10 uh, that's used for, uh, say, bodybuilders or people with certain heart conditions, that won't get into the brain very well. And there actually has been a proper double-blind trial, there have been two of them, in fact, that show a modest benefit. Uh, the second one, uh, it was a 12-month study, the second one, uh, and there were enough dropouts that the, uh, the result lost statistical significance. So technically, uh, we should call that a negative study but the actual magnitude of the effect on the patients was the same as in the first study, which was only six weeks long, that did reach statistical significance. Now, there was another question um, further down my list that says, I've tried to find this stuff, the coenzyme Q10 liposomal form, and I can't find it. Well, I've never seen it in a store. I've only seen it sold online. Amazon has it. And um, one brand, it may not be the only brand, is uh, it's called, the brand name is Lixorb, L-I-Q-S-O-R-B. So if you just um, search in Amazon on L-I-Q-S-O-R-B, you'll find it. It'll pop right up. Um, and uh, as with any other medication, if it doesn't help after a couple of months, then just stop taking it. But this should be done under the supervision of a doctor even though it's over the counter, I would make sure that your doctor is okay with this and that he or she is ready to field any questions about potential side effects it might have, which would be minimal, but still you want there to be a doctor who can help you out if the need arises. Okay, um, here's a, uh, a little bit of a technical question. My, my question is, will having a DAT scan be useful in identifying MSA or PSP when symptoms are mild? Can a DAT scan be done too early in the disease? Okay, what's a DAT scan? That, it's D-A-T-S-C-A-N. D-A-T stands for dopamine transporter. This is a way to image using a, um, it doesn't use MRI or CAT scan. It uses a different kind of imaging technique. It uses the same kind of technique that they would use in a bone scan. Uh, it, looks at the, um, the presence of a, a receptor in the brain. It's just a protein that acts as a receptor that uh, picks up dopamine on certain brain cells. And these are the brain cells that are lost in the Parkinsonian disorders. I mean, these are the, the main ones that all of the Parkinsonian disorders have in common that they lose. So, Yes, early in the course of MSA or PSP or Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies, these, uh, there will be fewer of these receptors and so the test will be abnormal. The thing is that you don't, that, that the test can't distinguish among those different diseases. And so, uh, so it's not useful for that purpose. Uh, the only purpose for which the government has approved the test is in distinguishing Parkinson's disease from benign essential tremor. In essential tremor, there's no degeneration of those brain cells, even though there is a tremor 
that can sometimes look like the tremor in Parkinson's. So I do not use a DAT scan to look for loss of those brain cells uh, because I can tell just from examining the person whether they have Parkinsonism with a small p. In other words, if they have the slowness and the stiffness, and if they do, then uh, that suggests there's a Parkinsonian disorder and the DAT scan is not going to uh, make that any more or less certain. Now the question is, okay, suppose somebody has other signs of PSP, like they just have a little trouble swallowing or moving their eyes or some personality changes. Is it worth doing a DAT scan to try to diagnose PSP? Well, no, because the DAT scan is positive in so many other diseases. Okay, uh, and there can be false positive DAT scans. If you're taking, there's a long list of medications that you might be taking that can produce a false positive DAT scan. Okay. Um, what medications are effective for controlling pain from dystonia and cramping in limbs? Uh, this is, uh, this is not usually a problem in PSP. It's more likely a problem with corticobasal degeneration. Uh, still probably doesn't affect the majority of people with CBD. Uh, but what can be done about that? Well, it's worth uh, muscle, trying muscle relaxants, ordinary muscle relaxants that uh, orthopedic surgeons use all the time uh, for people who, who have uh, spasms from a, a back problem or something like that. Uh, there is a epilepsy drug called Kepra, K-E-P-P-R-A, which is particularly helpful in controlling these painful spasms in people with CBD. I'm not sure about PSP. I just have not really had to use it in people with PSP. Uh, and Botox can be useful for this as well. Obviously, you should try the oral medication before you go to the Botox. Um, we're about the eye problems with PSP. Is cataract surgery a good idea? I'm glad you asked. It's, um, it's a very common situation that somebody who has PSP, whether they know whether they've been diagnosed with PSP or not, they start to develop problems seeing. And it might be uh, that they're unable to direct their eyes properly, which is what happens in PSP. They just can't maintain a good focus on the target of interest. And because the sharpness of our vision is not as good when we're just a little bit off from the target, somebody, the person will say, I'm, I'm having blurring of vision. So they go to the eye doctor and the eye doctor tries various lenses to correct uh, just a focusing problem. And, they don't work. And he looks in the eyes and says, um, well, you have cataracts. So the question is, well, okay, but are the cataracts the cause of the problem? Or more to the point, would removing the cataracts help the problem? Well, very often eye doctors are not very alert to subtle eye movement problems like occur in early mild PSP or CBD. So they don't pick up on the fact that the person isn't focusing well, isn't directing the gaze accurately at the target. And so they think, well, the only thing I can find that's abnormal here is the, uh, is the cataract. So let's try taking the cataracts out and see if that helps. Well, very often, of course, it would not help. I mean, it might help a little bit uh, if they were bad cataracts, but very often it's not going to help because that was not the main problem. So um, anyone who already has PSP and is told that they need their cataracts removed should certainly ask the doctor could this just be my PSP that's affecting the ability of my eyes to, to uh, look directly at the target? Does it have to be the cataracts? And um, just let the, the doctor consider that. It's a very tough question for the doctor to answer. It just has to rely on the doctor's experience with cataracts and, and with the uh, resulting difficulty in vision that patients with a given type and severity of cataracts are going to have. So very often you're just going to have to roll the dice with having the cataracts removed 
and see if that helps the problem. Okay. Um, is there any medication or device to help with freezing gait? What is freezing gait? This is where when you first stand up, you may have no, no trouble standing up, but then you just can't get that first foot started. And it's, and then, but once you do, which may take several seconds or in a more advanced case, maybe a few minutes, once you get that first foot started, then you can walk on a straight line just fine until you want to turn and then you freeze again or until you encounter some kind of a visual barrier like a, a threshold at a doorway or sometimes even a, a change in the color of the floor. Uh, this is a form of apraxia, A-P-R-A-X-I-A. -A. And uh, this is not that easy to treat, but there are some things to do. For one thing, uh, it's, this is a, a very, very interesting property of the brain. We have a, a program in our brain that controls normal walking, and that's the program that's involved with the gait freezing. But the other programs that control unusual types of locomotion are probably not involved at that stage, at that early stage. I'm talking about, for example, marching like a soldier or walking backwards or running or walking on tiptoes or walking sideways or walking upstairs. So if you, you can resort to those things, excuse me, you can resort to those things to overcome the freezing for a more, um, maybe a more practical solution would be using a visual cue, having something that you can look at on the floor about a foot in front of you, which allows you to overcome that initial freeze. You can just pick a little tuft in the carpet, pick a, you know, a, a, a little dot on a, uh, on a linoleum floor, anything that serves as a visual target for you to step towards to make that first step. If you use the cane or wouldn't mind using a cane, you can wrap some uh, contrasting tape around the very end, the bottom end of the cane, and that's a good visual target. So when you're frozen, you just put the cane, the tip of the cane a foot in front of you and use that as the visual target. Uh, you could also take one of these laser pointers that makes a bright spot on the floor and use that as your visual target. Just have it uh, in your pocket all the time or hanging from a belt loop. And there's a, there are walkers that come equipped with a laser built into the walker, where if you find yourself frozen, you just push a button with your thumb and the laser projects a line about the foot in front of you, like a, a starting line of the race. And you just, you just step over that line that gets the, the freeze unfrozen. Uh, then there's a medication, amantadine, which I prescribe a lot for PSP, can help with various things. Uh, that can help overcome freezing of gait in PSP. Okay. Uh, I get frequent headaches. Any correlation to PSP? Um, really, no. I mean, PSP does not cause headaches. The only time I've heard of headaches is when somebody has a lot of um, a spasm of their, the muscles in the back of their neck. Um, as you know, in PSP, people tend to sit up very straight. Some people actually have a, about 10% of people with PSP actually have a very forceful backward tilt of their head. And that can be painful in the back of the head. Uh, but usually just a couple of Tylenol or ibuprofen takes care of it. Uh, but headaches per se, no, PSP does not cause that. So uh, you should ask the doctor if there's some other explanation, maybe some medication that you're on is causing that. Um, all right. There were, um, maybe because of, uh, I don't know why, the general feeling of despair in society lately, there were, I had two or three questions that said, how do you know when the end is near? Uh, this is a tough, tough thing to talk about. Um, 
tough question to ask for the, uh, the family. Uh, often the patients will ask me that at the first visit, the people whose personality permits that kind of frankness. And um, the answer is that um, PSP is not the kind of thing that's going to uh, suddenly strike you down as if it were a stroke or a heart attack. Um, nor is it likely to cause a sudden choking to death uh, where you just choke on a hot dog or a piece of steak or something. The, the swallowing problem in PSP is generally a much more gradually progressive thing uh, that can result in pneumonia eventually. So uh, if when someone with PSP is nearing death, generally they're very immobile, um, unable to speak, having trouble swallowing. Um, when they ha because they're having so much trouble swallowing, it's hard to maintain nutrition. And then um, you start to lose weight, general functions of the body start to work less well, and um, you get dehydrated. And so generally the, the inability to eat uh, even just having three cans of Ensure per day is, is the sign that the end is near. Um, a lot of it I've also found is the attitude of the person. If they still have a positive attitude, that will enable them to, uh, that will produce the motivation to eat, to allow them to overcome their actual uh, motor disability and take in enough food and fluids to keep them going. But once they lose that positive attitude, uh, then it's another story. So uh, I'm sorry if that's just too short and glib an answer to a very difficult question, but um, I think that's the best I can, I can do for now. There's no blood test, x-ray, imaging, tapping reflexes, nothing like that uh, is a better answer than what I've just told you. Okay. Um, do seizures happen in people with PSP? My husband suffered a stroke eight weeks before his demise and in those eight weeks had recurrent seizures. These were managed with medication from hospice. Uh, no, PSP does not cause seizures. Uh, it may increase the risk of seizures a little bit, um, but uh, not anything that you'd ever notice. Uh, when you have a stroke, that can certainly cause seizures in anybody, you don't, PSP or not. Um, and the, the seizures after a stroke may start, uh, they, they typically will start several months later. Uh, same thing with seizures after a head injury. Uh, so, and they would be treated the same way as seizures of, uh, in anybody else. Uh, there's no, no seizure medications that have to be avoided in people with PSP, although some of them can cause a lot of sleepiness. And of course, there's already a sleeping issue in PSP. And, and so people with PSP may respond differently. They may have a, have a different set of side effects than those without PSP when taking seizure medications. Uh, does plasma work for PSP? What they mean by this, uh, well, what is plasma? Plasma is just the, the liquid part of the blood after the blood cells have been removed. So it has all of the nutritional substances, all the proteins, the antibodies, uh, the clotting factors, uh, but not the cells, not the red cells, white cells, or platelets. There have been experiments in giving people with all sorts of problems, plasma from young, healthy individuals who donate the plasma or get paid for it, I guess. Um, it has not worked, at least in neurological problems. And there actually was a, an experiment done in California by Dr. Adam Boxer, good friend of mine, who gave um, young plasma to people with PSP and CBD and unfortunately, it did not work. Uh, okay, um, is there any correlation with other conditions, such as having the 
BRCA2 gene or skin cancers or any cancers. Okay, uh, there is no correlation of PSP with any kind of cancer, unlike Parkinson's, which does correlate with melanoma. Um, and in, in Parkinson's, there's a reduced risk of non-melanoma cancers compared to the rest of the population. In Parkinson's, higher risk of melanoma, lower risk of non-melanoma cancers. In PSP, neither of those relationships exist as far as we know. Okay, let's continue here. I think we're, uh, we're good on time. Are hallucinations typical with PSP? No, definitely not. Um, they, when they do happen with PSP, it's, it's because of medication, the Parkinson medication or some other medication like for the bladder uh, that they're receiving. And so uh, when a patient of mine with PSP tells me that they're having hallucinations, the first thing I do is I immediately hone in uh, on their medication list and see what we can reduce. Now, of course, there is a condition that can look like PSP called dementia with Lewy bodies, where hallucinations can be a, an important part of the actual illness. Okay, um, eye problems such as dry eyes, sensitivity to sunlight, and eyes closing when I want them to open. How do you deal with that? Uh, well, in PSP, there is a, a problem with blinking. Uh, you just don't blink enough. It's, it's a very, uh, very drastic reduction. The average person, uh, healthy person, elderly healthy person blinks about uh, 20 or 25 times a minute. In Parkinson's, it's about 15. In PSP, it's about five. And so the surface of the eyes dries out. And when it dries out, it reacts. It gets inflamed, it gets red. And the, uh, the tear glands react by producing more tears. So you would think, oh, great. Well, no more dry eye. Well, the problem is that in order to, to normally lubricate the eye, it needs more than just tears. It also needs these oils that are on the inside of the eyelid and little glands inside the eyelid. And uh, those do not increase as a response to the irritation. So uh, the eyes get irritated. And when the eyes are irritated, you are sensitive to light. Light can hurt your eyes. And when light hurts your eyes, you have a tendency to blink. But also with PSP, there's also some people just a tendency to close their eyes anyway, even if the surface of the eyes is not irritated. It's called blepharospasm. And that can be treated with Botox. But very often the blepharospasm is just a reaction to the irritation of the surface of the eye. So the treatment for this is to use those uh, lubricant drops a lot. And if they don't work, there are all sorts of other ways to improve the hydration, the, the moisture in the eye. And there is a, um, the type of specialist to go to for this. Well, ophthalmologists do take care of it, but there is a type of optometrist called a neurooptometrist. I work closely with one and um, they have all sorts of procedures that they can try, try for this neurooptometrist. Um, what is the average amount of time a person lives after a diagnosis of PSP? Well, the statistics are, uh, this, this varies a lot, I have to say. The statistics are the average person with PSP from the initial symptom survives, uh, it's, there are different numbers in the literature. It varies from about six to nine years. A typical figure would be something like 7.4 years. Uh, that's from the initial symptom until death. Uh, and there are things that can make that longer or shorter, demographic variables. Um, I just had a paper published, a paper uh, accepted for publication that uh, doctors will be able to use to, to um, predict in the in individuals how long they have remaining to survive depending on all sorts of uh, input data. Uh, from the time of diagnosis, uh, diagnosis happens on average 
it used to be like four and a half years. Um, but in recent years, as more doctors have become more knowledgeable about PSP, thanks mostly to Cure PSP, also thanks to things like, uh, you know, Facebook, where um, the internet, where knowledge of these things can be more efficiently disseminated. Uh, more people are aware of PSP, more doctors are aware of it. And so the, the delay from the initial symptom to the actual diagnosis has been reduced to about two and a half years, from four and a half to two and a half, so that's good. Um, got another 10 minutes here. How can we help someone in the later stages of PSP when they seem to be having difficulty breathing, seemingly holding their breath? Um, well, holding your breath is not something that people with PSP typically do, even in the later stages. However, um, sometimes uh, old people, perfectly healthy old people, or people who have some kind of a diffuse brain problem uh, such as PSP or strokes or Alzheimer's disease, sometimes such people can, can have this, this um, pattern of breathing where they will breathe very deeply for about 30 seconds to a minute, and then gradually the depth of breathing, but not the frequency, but the depth of the breaths will decline to zero, and they will stop breathing for maybe 15 seconds or so, and then they'll start back up gradually. It's a, uh, a sine wave, a, a smooth wave. The technical name for this is chain Stokes respirations. And so you may simply be seeing the person when they're at that trough, at the low point in their depths of the breaths that they're taking. Now, having said that, I will point out that in multiple system atrophy, MSA, there can definitely be uh, abnormal rhythms of breathing. Uh, people can make a lot of noises when they breathe. They can have obstruction, all sorts of things, uh, and including apneic spells. And the apnea can, is usually obstructive. In other words, it's because of something, some relaxation of a muscle in the throat that shouldn't be relaxed. Uh, or sometimes it could even be central, which means it's coming from the brain. That's an MSA and not in PSP. Okay, let's proceed here. And if that does happen in MSA, then um, a, uh, some kind of a machine, a CPAP machine, BiPAP machine, something like that would be necessary. And that's something that should be uh, evaluated by a, a, pulmonary, a pulmonary doctor or a sleep specialist. Um, why hasn't any progress been made toward a cure or treatment? Yeah, that's what I wanna know. Actually, a lot of, tri a lot of progress has been made. I know that there isn't a cure on the market yet, but the amount that we know about what's going on in the brain in people with PSP and CBD and MSA is just incredible compared to what it was when I started out 30 years ago doing research in PSP. And there, I mean, there's now drug companies that are just lining up to start, to start trials of drugs with PSP. In fact, they're falling all over each other to recruit the patients. They have to be careful about getting the patients that are available because um, you know, there aren't that many people with PSP, fortunately, and so uh, it may be difficult to recruit trials in the locations where there's the expertise uh, on the part of the doctors. So, I mean, that sort of thing, which has been only been going on for the last maybe five to eight years, that is just a huge sea change compared to before. Okay, um, I think we pretty much, well, here's one. What's the current view of the use of Zolpidem, Esoplicone, Esopiclone, and other GABA agonists in treating PSP? And which symptoms do they help? 
person who asked this question has the same name as a very accomplished PSP researcher I know. And I'm wondering why he needs my opinion about this. But anyway, I'll, I'll answer the question at face value. Um, the answer is that uh, these, are, these drugs are no longer thought, there was a brief period of time, a couple of years, where, where Zolpidem at least was thought to maybe uh, be a specific treatment for PSP, at least for symptoms, if not actually slowing the progression. That is no longer thought to be the case. And I don't know any movement disorder specialists who, who use uh, Zolpidem, Ambien, for that purpose. Although you could certainly use it as a sleeping pill. Um, as for the other drugs, those are um, other uh, antidepressants, certainly anti the same set of antidepressants that you would use in anybody else can be used in PSP. But the GABA agonists as a group, uh, no, GABA, what, what is GABA? GABA is a neurotransmitter. It's one of the chemicals that the, the brain and spinal cord use to send messages between, between cells uh, and through the synapses. Uh, so there's a, there are drugs that can enhance the action of one of those chemicals. Uh, no, so as far as I know, there is not presently a big acceptance or effort in GABIT agonists for these diseases. Um, here's a question, and this question was also asked by a very prominent PSP researcher, or at least somebody with the same name as a very prominent PSP researcher. In fact, the guy who first discovered PSP and published it in 1963, his name is John Steele. And he is still very uh, active in involving himself in um, public activities relating to PSP. And the question is, um, what can you tell us about the pathogenesis of the proteinopathy? What that means is what is the, um, as you know, there is a protein called the tau, T-A-U protein that forms these globs in the brain cells in PSP. And so the question is, is there any new information about what's causing that to happen? Uh, complicated question. Uh, there's always new, new things being found out. I think the, the most recent, very exciting discovery was, uh, was from uh, University of Cambridge, Cambridge University in England, um, where a researcher named Michel Godet did this, used this new technique called cryo-electron microscopy. This, you know, cryo means very, very cold. So it's using a, a technique where, um, you do use an electron microscope under extremely cold conditions, and this allows you to look at the fine structure of molecules. You can look almost to the atomic level. Uh, and what he found is that the abnormal tau in PSP was different from the abnormal tau in cortical basal degeneration, which was different from the abnormal tau in Alzheimer's disease. Up to that point, we'd kind of been thinking, yeah, there must be some difference in the tau because these are different diseases. They affect different parts of the brain. Uh, and then they proceed at different rates. But for the first time, there is now a demonstration of an actual difference in the shape of the tau molecule, even though the sequence of the amino acids in the tau is no different. Okay, I think that's... Uh, all we have time for today. I'm sorry, John, I didn't give you a better, uh, more detailed answer to the question, but uh, shoot me an email. Thank you, Dr. Goldie. Thank you so much for answering all of these wonderful questions. And thank you, everyone, for submitting those questions um, over the past week, two weeks. To everybody that did, oh, that's happening. Um, to everybody that has been answer, asking the questions in the Q&A box, I have been uh, compiling them in a document and we'll be sending them directly to Dr. Golby for our next session on July 7th. I would also like to add that um, we will be making a couple of educational materials available, links to our website on a slide right after the end of this webinar. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Golby, for taking the time to answer these questions and for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. As long as you're willing to, to work with us on this, we'll continue to provide the platform to do so. So thanks to everybody that tuned in on Facebook and thanks to everybody that tuned in on Zoom and for your donations that you've helped to raise um, for this particular project. Thanks to Jacqueline Zendrian and events. And I think that's all we, we, that's all we have for today. So um, keep your eyes peeled to the Cure PSP website where this video will be archived um, very shortly. Thank you, everyone.